and those and those impacted by storms. So I uh, thank you today. We have some ICT members who have joined us. Uh, we invited our board and committee members, and for those who could make it, I appreciate it. As my understanding on the line today, we have uh, Mr. Jed Kincaid, our board member from Progressive, Craig Doherty from Texas Farm Bureau, uh, I believe Andrew Cervantes from ICT, our government and uh, legislative affairs manager, uh, Louis Brito uh, from FM Global, who was actually part of our resilience panel last week. Uh, Jay Thompson, our general counsel, is planning to join as well. Uh, Nick Rad Radberg from Union Standard, uh, Brian Kiefer from Allied, Angela Doss, a board member from Nationwide, and Gerald Ladner, our board member from State Auto. So we have a mix of personal and commercial lines riders, auto, home, and business. So I think it's a good group uh, to hear from you all today. And I hope, Richard, we can continue this with further uh, discussions moving forward uh, and get our members engaged and to start trying to find solutions to help uh, keep our economy and keep our state strong. So with that, I thank you for setting this up. I thank our panelists for joining us today. And I will turn it over to you, Richard. Well, Albert, thank you for uh, yours and Linda's support and interest in our collaboration. So uh, I know we've got a pretty full agenda. We're going to cram a lot into one hour. But uh, I do want to make sure, uh, Albert, that you and, and the members have joined us, um, that this is really a conversation. So do not hesitate to um, you know, jump in, ask a question. We'll, what we plan to do is we've got, a, as I mentioned, a pretty robust uh, agenda. I want to set the stage. Um, you're going to be hearing from folks who are a lot smarter than I'll ever be, uh, who will share with you some uh, cutting edge uh, innovations and technologies uh, and equipment that we think are very applicable to your uh, customers and clients um, in this endeavor for pre-disaster and risk mitigated resilience, which I'll talk a little bit about. And I'm gonna set up uh, our discussion and then really turn it over to the panel, let them do a quick introduction of themselves um, and um, I'll try to play audio visual, uh, Albert, with so many different people and bear with me. But let me put a context to um, how we started the Innovation Hub um, at the request of the Insurance Information Institute. Um, and now, in addition to working with III, we are also working with the Reinsurance Association of America. Um, it really started with Hurricane Harvey, um, even though we all know that the disaster started well before Hurricane Harvey, but it was such a seminal event, um, not just in Houston and Texas, but on a national basis. Um, we received a phone call from the city of Houston, from Houston Public Works and Houston Water. Um, when the river started uh, flooding the ravines um, and then the two major dams uh, overflowed, uh, leading to three or four of the major facilities for uh, public works in Houston water going completely off the grid. That led to them requesting from us the opportunity to build out the first ever um, 1 million gallon a day completely off the grid wastewater uh, treatment facility on the west side of Houston. And for those of you who are not from Houston, that is right in the middle of the energy corridor. So for um, about seven days, uh, British Petroleum, Shell, and a number of other companies, NOV, um, literally could not uh, get to their operations because there was 4 million gallons a day of wastewater completely over and around about a 10 square mile area. Um, and so this kind of a lesson learned for us was that how do you actually pre-vet, uh, pre-identify, pre-vet and pre-negotiate the placement of equipment technology and importantly supported by data science, which is what Bob will talk about. But as all of you know, this was not the first nor the last um, what really got us going before that was the drought of record in 2010. And as um, many of you know, the state of Texas at any given point is in and out of a drought, whether it's West Texas or South Texas, um, that causing a significant 
um, focus by the state of Texas to take $2 billion out of the rainy day fund and start this process of bringing the infrastructure up to uh, 21st century level. But not only did we have the droughts that we've gone in and out of, um, the Houston Ship Channel, as well as some of the other ports, have had these leaks and spills that have led to explosions that then have led to massive uh, issues with air and water quality. Um, we started taking a look at then this, this issue of um, what was the persistence of the floods, as well as other kinds of disasters across the past 10 years. Then finally, we had COVID hit us, and we thought, well, that was enough uh, to knock us back on our feet. But no, we had to have Storm Uri, a snow and ice event. And obviously, that led to a lot of difficulties for um, the state taking a look at not just the electric grid, but also the impact subsequently of frozen pipes and loss of water and then the damage subsequently for that. The next thing that we did is we convened a utility roundtable of about 40 major water utilities, urban and rural across the country, in partnership with one of our nodes uh, outside of Atlanta. And that led to them giving us a response to a survey that we did of over 150 different utilities, water utilities in this case. And this should not surprise you that, you know, what are the challenges that not just the public, but again, where we're looking at is public, private, and philanthropic uh, needs for pre-disaster risk mitigation. And you can see some of the issues that seem to be, I guess, similar across different industries. Um, and again, both public and private, where the CapEx cost of putting resources ahead of a disaster versus having to spend money to rebuild in a recovery mode. That then led to us taking a look at all of the different problems and challenges for uh, what we looked at, which is public-private philanthropic financing um, in alternative resources. State of Texas currently has well over $15 billion of funding from post Harvey, the presidential declarations. And then in turn, we have access to um, hundreds of billions of dollars of alternative fi financing, including what we're learning where the opportunities may be with the insurance and reinsurance, which I'll cover in a second. But you can look at these um, uh, items uh, you know, we've looked at historical losses and claims, we've looked at different um, financial and economic models, and then we started trying to understand what the red flags were. What were the barriers for unleashing innovation in alternative investment in capital? That then led to us taking a look at um, how the return on investment, or most importantly, the cost benefit analysis um, was shifting or pivoting. Many of you know that Wharton, working with the insurance industry through the Insurance Information Institute and others, have done significant work. They then brought in the National Academies um, on the building sciences on the federal side to correspondingly uh, confirm that the cost benefit analysis for a pre disaster risk mitigated investment was significant. Four to one was a minimum on that return or cost benefit. Uh, Albert is aware that we have been working now with the Reinsurance Association, uh, Congress, the, the administration, in what is a bipartisan effort um, to change the metrics on cost benefit analysis, but also take a look at some of the tax code that would free up insurance and reinsurance capital and new kinds of part, uh, public private partnerships. This is an example of what we um, realized that the insurance sector, especially the reinsurance um, sector was identifying that there was more opportunities to leverage um, federal dollars with non-federal investment, including opportunities for project development of large scale infrastructure as well as 
investment in some of the technologies that you'll hear about this morning that could be embedded in and around facilities and infrastructure. So the work continues on that FEMA, for example, issued their own recent report uh, recognizing that FEMA and the federal government will never have enough financing. There will never be enough money uh, completely in the NFIP to cover loss claims. And that again, it was it is a better value proposition um, to build better, build stronger, build more fortified, rather than trying to pay for uh, persistent recovery and rebuilding uh, over and over again. The last part I wanted to acknowledge was that we started looking at opportunities for creating new models of investment. And this is just but one example in you know, a couple of small little companies called Walmart, Prudential, who knew that the Nature Conservancy has its own venture fund, have come together working with the Maryland Department of Transportation and Maryland Environmental Services in EPA around the Chesapeake Bay to prevent future losses from floods, spills, leaks, other types of uh, perils. So proof positive that actually the public sector can incentivize uh, and unleash innovation through some new types of incentives and rulemaking. We think that this is an opportunity to do the same in the state of Texas. But I wanted you to see that it was not just these major players, but it was also companies like Opti, which are technology data-based um, innovations that allow for the measurement of water quality and water quantity that are changing the dynamics as well. So we'll send all these to you, but there's some more information about what we're working on, including several I think we've now conducted about 18 national roundtables with FEMA, Homeland Security, and obviously with the insurance and reinsurance community to give you an idea um, on any number of areas of innovation, whether it's fires, again, spills and leaks, floods. So with that, Albert, what I thought giving that context is that what we would do is jump into um, the presenters that we've lined up, if you'll bear with me, um, I am going to pull these up um, and get them ready uh, for us to share with you. And you'll have to bear with me because some of them were already ready to go and, and minimized. Um, so let me get this set here for us. And Bob, why don't you introduce yourself and I'll have your slides pulled up and ready to go. Okay. I am Bob Frady. I am the founder and CEO of Hazard Hub, now a guide wire company. We were just bought uh, last month. Um, started Hazard Hub af after spending several years at CoreLogic building these types of data sets before. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the big one there. I sent a smaller one um, okay, but that's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll cut through if you don't mind. I, okay. okay, so uh, we're going to go as fast as possible. We tell you all the bad things that can happen to a property. Wildfire, lightning, wind, hail, tornado, storm surge, FEMA flood, regular flood, plus property characteristics, fire station locations, hydrant locations, building permits for any piece of property in the U.S., whether it's commercial or residential, it doesn't make a difference to us. It's just a piece of property. We give you over 1,200 data elements in under two seconds. So you can instantaneously use this for underwriting, or if you're a municipality, you can get all of the locations inside of your municipality and see what the risks are for every property inside of your municipality. And finally, for those of you who like to see proof from other people, our friends at Bullpen were nice enough to tell us that um, they like our peril data the, the best. Most of this peril data stuff that has been in the market was developed between 10 and 25 years ago. Uh, and we brought modern technology and modern data science to the, to the fore to try to estimate those risks better. The way we look at Texas is Texas has a real big problem. The problem is that there are 16% more people in Texas than there were at the last census. And those people don't go up, they go out. So they move into areas that are traditionally dangerous. And then people get surprised. It's like, 
what do you mean there was a flood here? It's like, we tell you exactly what the science says should happen in an area. What you choose to do about it is really your call. Uh, but we provide that data quickly, efficiently, and inexpensively. That's it. That's, that's my, that's my uh, quick three. So, Bob, let me ask a question uh, generally and then um, uh, ask uh, for um, our ICT members to uh, give a quick response to uh, what I initially laid out, what you initially laid out, and then we'll go to the next group and do the same. But Bob, it would appear, based on the work that you've been doing and that we've been uh, collaborating with you and others, that there is more data than we've ever seen. So it's kind of this phrase, you know, drowning in data and thirsty for intelligence. We also have access to a lot more granular data, including FEMA beginning to release um, some of their NFIP data. Tell me where you see the greatest benefit to the end user and the end user in this case being both the insurance and reinsurance companies as well as their customers and clients. I think the um, insurance and reinsurance benefit is what's the correct technical price? You know, what's the risk adjusted price for a policy? And a lot of times people chase premium and that's okay, that's how you grow. Uh, but it's, but understand that this is what the technical price should be. What your street price is, that's really up to you. Um, but what is the risk adjusted price? Uh, and what potentially is the future risk adjusted price? Like wh what areas are subjected to sea level rise? Does that impact my ability to either write the correct premium or limit my accumulations in those areas that are the most dangerous? So that's the, that's the primary benefit that we bring. It's, it's pricing. And accumulation are the are the two things. And then, Bob, one of the other parts that I've learned over the uh, past two years of working around your world and with you and with um, Albert and others is that um, we're constantly getting new data. Right, right. every peril comes along and it's giving us new data mm -hmm. um, from the perspective of how this informs citizens and communities and frankly, um, decision makers who have resources to do certain parts of mitigation, kind of what you're thinking about that at this point? It's an interesting question because, you know, where does the responsibility for the municipality take over in some of this risk mitigation? Uh, in flood, you know, there are some programs where communities can participate in flood mitigation, but what about things like wildfire or wind or hail tornado? You know, when you expand a community out by DFW airport, you're gonna have a lot of lightning claims because the, the incidence of lightning is humongous out there. So that's a question that a lot of municipalities haven't faced. And frankly, a lot of consumers haven't faced. This information hasn't been easy for them to get. And so step one is putting the information in their hands. And step two is telling them what to do about it. You know, what do you do if you're in a, in a hail impacted area? What do you do if you're in a catastrophic flood impacted area? And these are things that we've started doing. We have a tool called Free Home Risk. You can type in your address and, and get, and which we partner with uh, the Resilience Hub on. So you can go in and see what your property looks like. The next step is how does the insurance industry partner with their risk exposed customers to say, here's how you can protect yourself rather than say, well, we're not going to insure you anymore because you're too much of a risk. That's a, I think that's a, a piece of, uh, that's a step that the industry is just getting to right now. Um, hey, Bob, uh, Richard, you went to where I was going to go. This seems to be bigger than the industry. Um, so government, state, city, U.S., federal, uh, even the builders. Uh, home builders, um, isn't this the tool that could also at least provide them some sense of, as you just touched on, where to build, how to build, uh, what happens if you put a bunch of homes sitting outside of a reservoir in Houston uh, when there's a flood? Uh, so it, it is a broader use for the industry. I get the industry underwriting and pricing, but it seems like there's another application here, if I'm understanding this correctly, that could be a much that maybe leaders, uh, local state leaders need to hear more about 
here's where you're putting things and here's the risk that happens. And builders make decisions about how do we build um, in certain areas? What do we build? What steps can we take to make our, our structures more fortified? I'll, I'll use the word fortified. But what, do you see this beyond just insurance? The, the answer is yes. I see it as a lot of different things. But as a small company, we've really had to choose our focus. You know, okay. selling into the insurance industry is, a, is an interesting enough proposition. Selling into the municipality is, is a whole nother um, level of complexity. So we've chosen to focus on insurance. But I think that there are, like, for example, when you buy a house, you should have a disclosure report that says, here's the properties, here's the perils that are exposed for this property. Here's the permits that have been pulled on this property. Here's the things that you should know with your eyes open going into purchasing a property so you can protect yourself. That's, that's one part. And then on the municipality standpoint, here is a layout for everything in your municipality. Here's your hydrants, here's your fire stations, here's, your risk, here's the risk areas for your location. And you know, for example, we ran a, uh, we ran a, a study for utility and we said that it was a small utility. We said $30 million of your equipment is in flood zones. What are you doing to mitigate that? They said, well, we'll just pass it to the ratepayer. You can't really argue with that. It's how things have been done. So the answer is yes, there is a much broader application. But one of the things that I saw in that, in that slight, that pie graph was staff resistance. To us, that's the biggest, um, that's the biggest um, barrier. All the other things are just excuses to overcome staff resistance. The way that people have always done it is the way they will continue to do it in the future until something bad happens. The let, me, let me, Bob, real quick, and I want to keep on moving um, through this uh, in introducing um, some of the other additional technologies. But Albert, to your point, um, we believe in the conversations that I think, you know, I've shared uh, with you and will share with the members that are on the, on the phone is we think that this is now shared risk, that this is now increasing the awareness of citizens, communities, the consumers, um, and frankly, the elected and appointed officials understanding where the shared risk is um, from both an operational level, uh, from the lifelines that Homeland Security and others are concerned about. And so, yes, the information that Bob and others have begun to pull together and, and make available to elected and appointed officials, we strongly believe that this is that moment in time to help them understand where they should be doing some of their own resource allocations. Like I mentioned, there's $15 billion of flood and related resources that are supposedly going out the door. Um, and this should give an opportunity for them to um, uh, use these kinds of tools to the benefit of engaging their decision making as well as introducing their citizens and constituents to, um, uh, to you know, more information, more knowledge. Yeah. Um, let me introduce and have uh, both Rahel and um, uh, Tasha, um, quote unquote, come up to the stage, so to speak. Uh, Rahel, uh, introduce yourself and I'll roll the slides for you. And you're muted, Rahel. Thank you, Richard. Hi, everyone. I am Rahel Abraham, and I am the founder and CEO of ClimaGuard. Should we just continue on? Okay. So I, uh, like Richard, came to the awareness of the um, ever-going disaster, flooded damage from Hurricane Harvey, specifically because it was a year of just a one after another flood incidents. Uh, Hurricane Harvey was just one, right? And then we also had Maria um, and Irma that same year. Um, and during that time, I lost my car. And that was my number one way of being able to mobilize and recover post a flooding event. And so um, after that case, I looked deeper and I realized, next slide, Richard, um, that flooding affects everyone on a billion dollar level outside of hurricanes. And so the likelihood of me relocating and not being impacted by flood was only going to serve a certain amount of time before I'm hit again. 
And therefore, I wanted to find a better solution out there beyond just a generator and uh, some bottled water to be more resilient every season, being that I live in Houston. And so what I decided to do was provide a tool, next slide, that would cover your valuable assets within a short period of time. And that tool is called the Climate Guard Temporary Protective Enclosure. And what it does is it completely covers whatever you put inside and make it flood proof. Um, by doing that, we're able to mobilize right away. We're able to save uh, from complete disaster loss, especially post an evacuation, as well as be able to have something on hand that is going to keep you uh, protected no matter what time of day or no matter if you have electricity or not, because it is something that is um, quite easy to set up and put back away and reuse. And so um, next slide. By using this uh, tool, I've also realized that the average payout from uh, auto claim loss in Texas is about $12,000. And over 41 million Americans are actually affected or are living in flood zones. It's growing obviously. And so um, just by being able to have access to 0.1% of this population, allowing them to have a true protective device on hand, we could save the insurance industry you know, at least $500 million. And so this is something that I believe that could be a potential, is there another slide after this, Richard? Oh, sure. A potential opportunity for um, partnerships within the industry, insurance industry, within municipalities, um, I already know that within the NFIP program, there is a reimbursement for up to $1,000. And so I just believe that being able to extend this type of um, opportunity across the different memberships would be able to save not only the insurance from loss, but their members from loss, in which case create a win-win scenario. And that is Climate Guard. Thank you. Wonderful. Rahel, we will come back to you. Yes. Let me um, uh, pull... Tasha's uh, slides up and um, Tasha, give me one second and sure. we'll uh, get yours and then we'll um, throw it open to a couple of questions. So we're basically the residential version of what Rahel has created. <laughs> My name is Tasha Fuller. I'm the CEO and co-founder of FloodFrame. And FloodFrame is um, a flood protection solution for any structure. So um, if we can pull, before I go into what I wanna say, I usually like to let the technology speak for itself. So I'm hoping this video will work. And give me, give me, give me sure. one, so. um, if the sound doesn't work on it, then I will just jump in and narrate it, but let's see. Yeah, just having a little bit of a, there we go. Flood frame is a modular flood protection well, that is- Does it just mean that the screen is frozen? A container storing waterproof cloth is stored in the ground, approximately six inches from the building. I'm just seeing the front page. Is that just me? No, um, there's no video. Okay. No video. Yeah, let me find out what's going on here. Okay. Can now we're on the right slide. Uh-huh. Okay. It may have frozen, but let's just I'm not living there you go. today. Okay, bear with me. Can you see your slide here? Yes, I see the whole PowerPoint. Yeah, I'm not Set sure. Up. You may want to keep on going. Um, sure. Uh, and I'll try to get this working with Zoom this morning. Okay. Sure. So it's a, it's a full spectrum flood protection solution. It goes around any type of structure. So it's very versatile. It goes in the ground around the perimeter all the way around. Um, and it's uh, concealed underground. And it uses physics, so it's a very simple solution. When floodwaters come a in, a flood protection solution that is pre-installed around the house. Are you seeing a that? Container stored no. Cloth is stored in the. It's just not going to work. Uh, okay, well that's okay. Uh, Richard, maybe you need to share your desktop and not just the PowerPoint. Perhaps that would. 
Maybe you're limited to this your PowerPoint um, application. Let's just keep on going. Okay, so um, what you're seeing here is actually our latest installation um, where you just see the lids. The system is underneath there um, and it's a very lightweight cloth made by Tyvek and it's wrapped around a lightweight tube. One end of the cloth is anchored down in the ground. So when floodwaters come and get into that um, box there, the whole system floats. So it works on buoyancy. So it'll float up out of the box and it lays on top of the flood water. And then the water itself um, pushes the, unrolls the cloth and pushes it up towards the structure and it continues to unroll up the structure as high as the water goes. So it's basically creating a barrier between the house or whatever structure it is and the flood. So that's, it's very hard to visualize. I understand that. So I highly recommend you go to our website and look at the video um, so you can see it yourself because it kind of takes seeing it to understand it. Um, were you trying something else, Richard? Yeah, I was, uh, uh, something's locking up on okay. um, Zoom, but I apologize. Keep on going. Okay. Oh, that's okay. Um, there's not really much else to say. Uh, we're hoping to be able to partner with the insurance because the biggest question now is how can we get this to the masses and how can we help them afford it? Um, oh, here's kind of a good picture of it. Go to that next slide, Richard. Wait. <laughs> Yeah, get, get, just got to love it. Let's see if we can get it to click this time. Yeah, we'll roll with it. Here we go. Flood frame is a modular flood protection solution that is pre-installed around the house. A container storing waterproof cloth is stored in the ground approximately six inches from the building. During a flood, the lids are either manually or automatically removed and the cloth is pushed onto the ground. The cloth is then pushed towards and up the house by the force of the water. So this is the cool part. The water there is doing all the work. So you just wait for the water to come in and then the water will come and push the- no action by the homeowner and requires no electricity. After use, the cloth is removed and replaced. It requires a yearly service to ensure secure function. And the cloth can be reused over and over again. We just recommend that um, we come out and take a look at it and make sure that any big debris or something didn't come along um, where something needs to be fixed up. Um, it does go into the ground, so it also helps protect the foundation and it controls seepage. Uh, it can go as high as the water goes. Our standard solution is uh, four feet, and that's just based on calculations for what um, a standard house wall can hold because it's holding back that hydrostatic pressure of water. Um, if there's a commercial building that wants to go higher than four feet, we'll just do a quick analysis to make sure that structure can take it. Um, but our biggest goal now and hurdle is getting this to as many people as possible. We've done six installations in the greater Houston area now. Um, we are internally working on how to make it more affordable and um, easier to produce. So we're working on manufacturing currently something that um, can be um, produced uh, on a bigger scale than what we have now. Um, but I'm super interested in feedback and um, to see what you guys think and how we can maybe partner to get this to more people and make it a little bit affordable for people. And that's it. Great. And apologies for um, the Zoom technical difficulty. Let me um, uh, ask one or two questions um, uh, in, um, to Rahel and Tasha. Uh, and then, Gerald, uh, I know you've got a, a question I'll uh, return to here. Um, before COVID, we were making lots of interesting progress, Rahel, with talking with auto dealers. I think, um, Albert, one of the questions that would be great to engage with uh, Progressive and, and uh, the auto um, insurers that are on the, um, on the call is what we were looking at is connecting um, Rahel with auto dealers who were including climate guards, so to speak, in the final phases of financing, whether somebody was purchasing or leasing, and then working with the auto uh, insurers, uh, carriers, um, to find a way to incentivize 
both the consumer and the dealer to um, leverage the use of climate guard for future protection of the vehicle. I'd be great to give some kind of feedback with Rahel and to follow up if we can find uh, the right kind of partnership um, fairly soon uh, with some of the dealers. But any response, Albert, from you or your colleagues on the phone with us? Well, I think Jed may be off at this point uh, from Progressive. Uh, okay. Gerald State Auto is asking a lot of questions about both products. So right. uh, I think there'd be some interest there. I think the question is getting it to market price. I know particularly with the, the uh, home flood product, my first question was, is it only for new, new homes, new construction, or can you retrofit a home to install, install that? And then on the auto flood protection, I'm just like, how do you put that thing on? Um, it's a very simple question, but I'm, it looked like you drive up on it and do whatever to get it on board. So, Rahel, I call it the Ziploc bag of a car. So, okay. Yeah. So, so kind of what it looked like. Exactly. There's a video online as well on our <clears throat> website, but you simply lay it, you unzip it, lay it flat, and then you drive over to the middle bottom op opening or you place your items in the middle bottom opening. You zip it closed and kind of like Tasha, it works with buoyancy. So as floodwaters surround the items, it will start floating. Um, we noticed cars would float after about a foot and a half. Right. And so it rise with floodwaters and it'll recede back down with the floodwaters. And that's how you keep it safe. Um, because there's no, that surface area is enough for it to give that coverage to where it can start becoming buoyant in water. Um, okay. And it's reusable as well, like I said. And it comes in, the nice part is it comes in a, in in a carrying the, case. So it's portable, yeah. yes. Yeah, it's a very, I mean, that, and like a two feet long carrying case. Okay. And it could fit up to a mid sized SUV. So, you know, it expands quite large. You can put your whole living room um, set in it. And you can store it in your trunk, you know, your closet, wherever it's convenient for you. Okay. And I see Gerald has another question. How much? Oh, how much? Yes. So it ranges between three ninety nine to four seventy nine. So it's very affordable, less than deductible. That was intentional. Um, and we warehouse out of Houston as well, so we're very conveniently located. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then Tasha, there's a couple of questions that you're you're being asked. And I think one of the things also, uh, Albert is. Um, Again, pre-COVID and now trying to come back out um, you know, in whatever stage of life we are professionally, um, the mortgage. There's been some discussions uh, on the mortgage banking side, um, on the banking side as well for individuals that are doing home improvements, uh, retrofit upgrades, as well as obviously new construction. Um, that's on the the residential home building side. Um, what we also looked at, uh, and Tasha, please jump in, um, is the idea of smaller footprint commercial um, facilities, as well as even some of the public uh, infrastructure. So um, things like um, uh, opportunities for center point has these small substations. Uh, the energy, you know, power guys have small substations. Um, Tasha, what's your thoughts on where that can best, you know, these different opportunities unfold? Yeah. So, so far, we've actually only done this on uh, residential retrofitting. So that means you know, houses that already exist. And that's what drives up the price is having to retrofit it on an existing house because you're cutting a lot of concrete. You're moving gas lines, water lines, electric lines. You're messing with their sprinkler systems and then people care a lot about their landscaping. So you got to fix all that up too. And you got to put, you know, so it's actually the retrofitting that drives up the cost. If we were doing this on brand new construction on brand new homes, it would be very minimal because that home builder can just leave a trench for us. And before they pour anything or do any um, kind of landscaping, we go in and set it in and it would be very, very affordable. Um, so, yeah, that was a question in the comments was if this has only been done on new houses and no, we've never done it on a new house. I would love to. And um, we're only doing, we've only done it on retrofitting and yeah, it can go around anything. So, you know, we've had, um, we're looking in overseas, actually, they're going to do some uh, railway stations. They're working on doing this around an entire trailer park there. Um, so yeah, we can do this around anything that has a structure. We can put it around and there's not really a size limit on it either. We can do it any size. Um, 
Someone asked if we can do this in Minnesota. Sure. Um, we just need to get some help up there. Some We would work with a contractor and basically come teach them how to do it. Um, we're working. That's how we want to expand is to find different contractors in different areas that can do this for us. Um, how much? Somebody asked how much. Like I said, it really just depends on how complicated the house is, how many corners, you know, how much are we having to change. Um, so I said we've done six. The cheapest one we've done was um, 30000 The most expensive was a huge house. It was, um, I think, 120000 So it, it depends on the size and complexity. And that house also got a brand new generator from us, and we did a, a lot of extra work for them. So we gave them a kind of a whole emergency prepared package. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of versatility in this product and we're excited to get started. We would love to hear some more feedback on what you guys think is the next step for us. Thank you. Thank you. And Albert, one of the things that we, uh, one of the opportunities that we began to recently um, explore is with some of the new uh, uh, planned communities mm -hmm. uh, where you're looking at um, anywhere from 500 houses to, you know, a couple of thousand houses who happen to be in a um, watershed or floodplain area um, that, that this would frankly mitigate more of the, the planned community and in a sense get it almost defined and marketed as a additional flood proofing type of community or flood proof resilient community. So um, it seems like it seems like you'd have some interest from developers uh, as well as builders. Both would be thinking about how do I what you just said, how do I make my new community more resilient to a flood. I live a mile from a, a river. Uh, from my neighborhood, which is a few years old, this would have been a perfect idea to help protect the next time the Blanco River rises up and floods. Um, floods our neighborhood. So yeah, I think there's an opportunity here. I know we have some members on and we would be happy to share this with them to explore more so from the insurance side. But I know there's like everything else, there's also another side to this that could help uh, with promoting and helping distribute a product that could it's very interesting to watch. You could, uh, particularly down in Houston, protect uh, against uh, the frequent flooding there. Yep. All right. Yep. All right. Well, let me uh, go to our um, uh, next um, set of presenters, and we'll keep on going because there's a lot. And I know I'm going to, we're probably going to run over uh, by about five, 10 minutes, Albert. Um, but I wanted to um, introduce. Um, John Brinkman and um, and then Hani Tan. Uh, these are two that are frankly um, unique uh, because what we started looking at is if you remember, um, we were discussing in my initial presentation uh, this issue around spills and leaks, flood, you know, and fires. Um, what we now know is that um, you can have benzene leak out of one of these large tanks, it hits water, it vaporizes and static electricity in the air can um, ignite it, which is what happened. Um, and um, again, we're just using examples, case studies. These are true in any number of places, uh, more than just Houston or the Houston Ship Channel. But um, Albert, in this case, when you have to shut down the Houston Ship Channel or any port in this country, it's a minimum of $100 million a day of operational losses. So um, with that, let me um, uh, introduce, and John, why don't you, I'll pull the slides up while um, you're introducing yourself. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, Albert, uh, thank you for allowing the opportunity to uh, introduce the technology to your group. So the product is called Imbiber Beads. The word Imbiber and Absorb are synonyms. There's a lot of confusion as to what an absorbent is, but if I use an analogy to the super absorbents most people are familiar with in the form of disposable baby diapers, those uh, uh, polymers are engineered to wick water away from a baby's bottom. With the Imbiber Beads, uh, fundamentally different, they're oil sensitive. In other words, they only react uh, in the presence of oils, fuels, and solvents. And uh, there's a lot of confusion as far as what an absorbent actually is. 
What you're going to hear about today is, as far as we're concerned, uh, the only product of its kind anywhere in the world. Uh, the Enviber beads uh, eliminate the liquid phase. In other words, the product itself uh, will go into the Enviber beads and um, uh, eliminate the issue of secondary contamination. Uh, one of the uh, other performance characteristics is their ability to reduce the rate at which hazardous vapors off gas. As uh, most people are aware, it's the vapors that support combustion and it's the vapors that are toxic when inhaled. So very, very key uh, performance characteristics of uh, oil sensitive superabsorbent polymer. We deal specifically in three areas, uh, spill response. Um, I've seen some innovations as far as uh, preventative measures. We also provide a series of uh, gravity flow drain protection systems and are very active in the water filtration uh, side of things as well. So a quick demonstration of how the beads work. Hopefully it will work. Uh, can we go back? Yep, there we go. Okay, great. So the beads themselves are roughly the size of salt or sugar granules, but they're spherical in shape. And when you introduce an organic liquid, oils, fuels, and solvents, you can see the liquid diffuses into the polymer structure, which causes them to swell. And in accordance with American Society for Testing and Materials, this is a required performance characteristic for an absorbent. Um, so we eliminate that liquid phase. Next slide. Uh, we've incorporated the um, Viber beads into a number of value added products that are complementary to existing spill response technologies. What I'm demonstrating here is a containment boom where we've attached our Viber bead blankets to it. So, not only does the containment boom, which I believe is state of the art, as far as this particular type of mechanism, um, which contains it and prevents it from uh, tracking downstream, but <clears throat> the Enviro beads also allow for uh, the uh, cleanup to be initiated and uh, also adds to stability to the containment boom. Next slide, please. Uh, so Hurricane Harvey has been uh, part of a couple of the presentations to date. Uh, most people in the Houston area or Harris County are aware that uh, dozens of uh, floating roof tanks, bulk storage tanks uh, failed. And as a result, several hundred thousand gallons of known carcinogens and mutagens were released into the immediate area, exposing the populace to those types of hazardous uh, materials. Uh, to combat against this, we've incorporated the Enviro beads into what we refer to as gravity flow drain protection systems. Those systems are allowed, or, or sorry, are engineered to allow water to pass, but in the event they're contacted by a catastrophic release, such as those we witnessed uh, during Harvey, uh, the system is designed without the requirement of any electronic sensors, no electricity and no moving parts to automatically seal the leak path. So this keeps everything on site, minimizes the damage to the immediate area and uh, the exposure for the uh, urban populace uh, within the region. Uh, what you see on the bottom right, sorry, go mm -hmm. back one. Quick. I'm sorry. Not a problem. Okay. So this is a, a system that we have designed for that floating roof tank. You can see uh, you've got a drain that allows the water to come into a reservoir in that reservoir are a number of Enviro bead cartridges that will selectively filter out the contaminant. Uh, and if there is no contaminant, allow the water to pass. So it would have alleviated that particular issue with respect to those bulk storage tank facilities. Okay. Cost is always a question. So I've uh, used an example again, uh, the ship channel being the number one place. This was an incident during March uh, 2014 was 168,000 gallons of solvent that was released. Uh, one of the issues with respect to any spill is that they reach unmanageable proportions within a very short period of time. This particular spill tracked down to the Gulf of Mexico, took 33 days uh, of operations at a cost of uh, about $125 million. The recovery rate was about 5% of that amount, which works out to uh, roughly $15,000 per gallon for the amount uh, recovered. 
Uh, the overall value proposition is that had you used that $15,000 per gallon rate, the total cost of the operation for the 168,000 would have been uh, in excess of $2.3 billion. So not necessarily good value for the money being spent. Conversely, had Enviro bead products been used, in this case, I've used the most expensive proposition, our blankets. And uh, we estimate that the spill would have taken three days because the capture and containment of the liquid is absolute. Once it goes in, it can't be re-released. 85% uh, of the 168,000 would have resulted in a total cost of just under $5 million or uh, a relevant cost of 33. Uh, 35 per gallon. Uh, the disposal mechanism for the Enviber products is energy from waste. So we take a uh, formally a problem uh, issue and turn it into a benefit. So if you have any other questions, please um, feel free to uh, contact us or uh, through Richard's uh, connections as well. And let me put a, a couple of things in, in context. And Lou wrote a, um, a, a note for us to take a look at. Um, Albert, um, and I, you know, you know me, I'm just real straightforward about all of this, all right? Um, the ultimate um, spill risk that occurred both uh, in water and air quality um, from the ITC spill along the Houston ship, ship channel that led to some major political exposure uh, by Harris County and ultimately led to a out of court, very public settlement, $4 million, $5 million is a hell of a lot less than what uh, the ultimate cost was both to the ship channel and to, um, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> to ITC and others. So I think Lou, there'd be a great opportunity to talk with you offline a little bit about this as well as the next uh, presentation because one of the things also, Albert, we're finding is, is that these collaborations, um, John, I, I don't know why I'm going blank, but the collaborations where all the companies kind of come together um, in co-ops co -ops or, or, you know, um, mutual aid, mutual aid, uh, Albert, to be very, very blunt, are not working um, as successfully as, as has been reported in the past. Um, and so I think we can work with FM and others on finding ways to, again, work with their clients um, and mitigate um, both the legal and the political risk, as well as some of the other um, scenarios uh, that have emerged. Um, so, Lou, thank you for that question. Um, honey, well, we're... Um, while I'm pulling your presentation up, if you want to make an introduction, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Hani Tan. I am a co-founder and chief strategy officer of Nanotech. Uh, Nanotech is a, a material science company, and we've developed a, a synthesized a molecule. So it's basically, you can think of it as a, as a powder that we can embed into uh, media and media being resins, uh, plastics and cement. Uh, so that media inherits the properties of our additives. So basically what it will do is it will reduce the thermal conductivity of, of those materials and increase its emissivity. And I can go into that uh, in the next slide, if you don't mind. So basically what, what happens is there's a heat flux or uh, an impingement flame. Um, and it will basically bounce off the surface of whatever media that uh, that has our additive in it. We have our own line of uh, fireproofing coatings and thermal insulation coatings. Uh, but again, we can we can add our molecule into a bunch of stuff, right? So the two basic properties is uh, it reflects heat, so that's called the emissivity, and it actually makes it extremely hard for heat to go through. Uh, the thickness of the media that we embedded it to. So it will take a long time for uh, heat to go through. And that's how we protect uh, structures uh, um, and, and things of that nature. That's very, it's substantially different um, from the technology that exists today. So today, most fireproofers or fire retardants uh, have a reactive chemistry. Basically, they take heat and create 
uh, and drive a chemical process. And through that process, they hopefully, that's their claim, you know, reduce fire. And, and in most cases, it works somewhat well, but uh, because we have a physical process, um, we don't exhaust that process ever. So basically, you can keep on firing uh, into, our, into our coatings and additives, and basically, they won't catch fire. Um, we have a video, and that's probably easier to show you how to do that. Um, Which one do you want me to pull? Yeah, just, you should just click on that, and it should go. But um, yeah. there's there's an egg video, there's a bottle video, whichever whichever one. Give it a second. Yeah. And then, um, honey, hopefully this will connect. Um, let's see if it, it goes. Yeah, you can take the volume out of it. I can't really see it. I'm not sure if the other guys are seeing it. No, there's no video. Oh, there's no video, just sound. I can try to share my screen and show it through my screen if, if that's okay. Is Richard muted? I can't hear Richard now. Can or cannot hear me? Can't hear you now. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. So basically, uh, you know, we're doing this by hand, uh, obviously, just to show that uh, our coating is completely um, inoffensive to 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 the touch. Uh, obviously, in large applications, we can actually um, spray it. Uh, it's a sprayable. Uh, in about two three millimeters of the coating, we can create a fifteen hundred temperature differential. Uh, the stuff that you see charring there on the top, that's actually the resin that we use to project our molecules. Um, that resin itself, it's water-based. So as you can see by the, the fire attacking the bottle, there's basically uh, no black smoke, not even a hint of smoke. So that's another benefit of that. Um, the same technology can be applied at low temperatures as well, or even negative temperatures. So it keeps hot where it should stay or cold where it should stay. So we've done beer tanks, we've done roofs, where we're saving people a lot of money in uh, AC bills. Um, and as you can tell, I mean, there's basically nothing's coming out of that. And you can see that that flame is about 2000 F. We can withstand about 4000 F. Um, and Mike is brave enough to do those videos with his kids. So he, he does that in, <laughs> at his home. <laughs> um, so you can tell, you know, the, the water's lukewarm. Um, we obviously we've done the STM codes. We're talking to FM Global. We're talking to UL through go through all the all the uh, codes to to be applied. We're working with the state of California uh, for their utility poles, um, and so we you know I, you know we're working with a bunch of people. Um, that charring that you see is obviously that resin that we use to project our media. That white stuff that's basically the nano shield, which kind of centers in place and protects. Uh, uh, and protects whatever structure you have underneath. But like I said, you don't need to have an 1800 degree fire. It can also work in, in regular temperatures, protecting and insulating homes. And um, so it's a very unique technology. The fact that you can actually add the additive into a bunch of other media like paints and resins, it does wonders for a lot of things. And that's my three minute pitch. Perfect. Yeah. So one of the two quick uh observations um uh albert to you and and lou and and others that are listening in is what we looked at was th this issue again of spills leaks that converted into fires or other uh events um uh, for fireproofing fire protection um, so if you think about for Texas, if you think about what happened with the Bastrop fires, which is now about five, seven years ago, the amount of the infrastructure that was lost, not just on the trees, but the surrounding residential and commercial, um, if we had had um, the nano shield in a paint form, um, we could have reduced the spread of the fire. Uh, maybe not on the trees, but at least the the spread to uh, commercial and residential infrastructure. 
Uh, what's now being discussed, uh, as Hani mentioned, is the opportunity to work with Pacific Gas and Electric on their poles and other um, providers of electric poles um, so that you, again, limit the spread, minimize the spread, um, and or the, um, the start of fire while it leaps. Um, so any questions from um, Lou, from you or others? All right, so, all right, Lou, thank you. Um, any questions of uh, John on the spills and leaks side of things? Uh, there was a question uh, concerning uh, whether or not the beads work on PFOS. I know you and I've had several conversations about that. Right. Um, the answer is yes, um, but the concentrations of of the PFAS, PFAS uh, are quite minute. Um, what I've approached the industry about was using the beads in conjunction with the firefighting foam. As long as the liquid is in, or sorry, the chemical is in a liquid state, it will continue to off gas, which is what the foam is used to suppress. Um, so it's complementary to what's being used both for firefighting and vapor suppression. Perfect. All right. So I promise that we will uh, uh, stay on our uh, go just a few minutes more. Um, uh, Albert, uh, and I appreciate y'all's patience. I know it's a lot of information, but at least an opportunity to um, see a little bit more um, about a number of solutions that are out there, again, to work with you and in the members. Um, this is the one um, that now gets us closer to the, the most current uh, threats around COVID. Um, and so Santiago, will you introduce yourself and I'll um, help run the, the presentation. You gotta take yourself off mute, sir. Thank you, Richard, sorry about that. So good morning, everybody. And thank you, Richard, for, for this opportunity uh, and for all the hard work you've, you've done. Uh, my name is Santiago Mendoza, Jr. I'm Senior Vice President for Integrated Viral Protection. Uh, we are a brand new company uh, that started out last year uh, around March when the pandemic hit. Uh, we went, um, we, we launched our company on September the 10th of 2020 and, and, and here we are today. So whenever you're ready, Richard, let me know. Okay. So this first slide right here that Richard is, uh, um, uh, was putting uh, earlier, uh, last year when we launched, uh, we were actually recognized by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers as, uh, a, 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 um, as one of five uh, companies uh, that, that uh, were awarded that, that prestige and the only filter company. Uh, this year, we were awarded uh, Engineer of the Year for the actual uh, invention uh, by the Engineering News Record. Um, we actually have a collaboration with all these, uh, all these school schools and companies that you see right now on there. Um, this was actually taken to the University of Houston Superconductivity Lab, uh, where they uh, uh, helped us uh, in, in, in develop it into what it is today, uh, to be able to hold uh, uh, um, the, the heat in our filter uh, that heats up to 180 degrees uh, Celsius. So almost 392 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and then we took it to the Galveston National Lab uh, in Galveston, which is a level four lab, and uh, the scientists uh, came back. And by the way, this was a uh, uh, first time that uh, uh, private public uh, partnership uh, of this uh, um, size was put together for, for something like this. These scientists came back and they said that our filtration system, our heat and nickel mesh foam filter actually killed the coronavirus instantly first pass at 99.999%, even when they pushed it 270 fold. This virus was actually brought in from California from patient zero, uh, the first person that was diagnosed with COVID. Uh, and so they, they, they went back in there on the next slide and they said, uh, we wanna try anthrax. Uh, and we said, absolutely. As everybody knows, anthrax is a gold standard when it comes to clean uh, indoor air uh, quality spaces for laboratories, hospitals, surgery, uh, surgery uh, uh, centers. Um, they came back and they said it, it does the same thing. 99.999 instant kill uh, and, and uh, um, 
first pass through uh, for the anthrax as well. And they also pushed it four and a half percent. This was the first time in the history uh, that uh, they had uh, tested uh, a virus uh, like this in the air uh, with, with, uh, uh, and, and had this type of um, results. Immediately we went into production um, uh, to uh, all that. We, a lot of uh, articles that were written, materials today, physics, uh, where we are in there, uh, as well as where we're, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you guys, uh, through all this right here, we are now endorsed by the Texas Hospital Association, uh, the Texas Education Agency, the Texas Restaurant Association, MIT, Argonne National Lab, uh, of course, the Galveston National Lab, Texas A&M Experiment and Engineering Station, uh, and the University of Houston Superconductivity Lab, uh, to name a few. Dr. Pressler, who uh, uh, is a distinguished physician there, said, if it kills, and from our, our previous testings, when it kills anthrax, this device, this uh, uh, biodefense indoor air protection system is going to kill everything that you guys see right here to include variants uh, uh, as well. Uh, but uh, it, it influenza and all that. We are in hospitals, we are in schools, in businesses, restaurants, across the, actually in the world. And as of right now, specifically here in the United States, uh, we did case studies with schools uh, and with hospitals and ever since uh, that, that had previous uh, uh, cases of COVID and infections, um, since we've installed and deployed our, our technology, they've had zero uh, uh, cases and, and zero have been traced back to them. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a, an example. Uh, Post-acute medical allowed us to go in there and do a scientific study. Uh, we actually measured the particulates with a third party company uh, called Air Answers here out of Houston. They measured the, uh, the bottom, middle, and, 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 and high level of the floor, sent it to, uh, uh, again, a third-party lab, not, not, not by us, uh, and, and together with the CDC. And they came back and they said, this room with a patient that has COVID, has very high levels of COVID all over the room. We then put uh, one of our filters in there for three hours, uh, and then we remeasured uh, with the particulates by the third-party company, sent it to the lab, got back the results and they said, this room now has zero particulates uh, of COVID. Uh, and so the owner of a post-acute medical, Tony Masatano, then went out and said, uh, I can't believe we've been putting our, our staff, our members, everybody in, in, in this. And so he is now deployed, uh, uh, is deploying to all his hospitals, all his rehab hospitals all over the country. We are certified uh, in the U.S., outside of the U.S. We're FDA certified to sell during the pandemic where uh, uh, we meet and, and, and actually uh, uh, over our, the ASHRAE um, uh, requirements. We also had this tested in California being that they have some of the highest indoor air quality uh, um, uh, testing and measurements and we pass with flying colors. Um, uh, I'm trying to think if there, there's anything else that, that I'm missing, Richard. No, I I think you um, you covered it. I know that uh, there's a lot more behind this, uh, Albert. Uh, for you know purposes of uh, IVP, it's a Texas-based company, which is one of the reasons why we highlighted it. But the other is is that this issue originally, when we were uh, uh, talking with IVP, we thought we were on the reopening, the slash big reopening and we now know that we're going to go through phases of reopening um what we looked at here was working with um you know the property casually uh on um this idea of reopening um buildings operationally whether they are large distribution centers that are turning employment uh every you know six to nine hours um, you know, like a um, Amazon, all the way mm -hmm. over to uh, you know commercial um, buildings, whether they are banks or you know law firms, as well as uh, the the tourists, the hotels and resorts uh, areas. And so we thought we ought to share this one as well, uh, Albert, with you and your uh, colleagues um, of showing. You know, going from automotive, residential, commercial, industrial, different types of threats, um, now to one most recently dealing with um, the uh, post-COVID world. So, 
Any no. questions from you or your colleagues? I don't think so. Obviously, I just I see this as more of a risk management issue, um, particularly to avoid future pandemics. Um, because the coverage issues, I think, are fairly, or at least from the industry standpoint, are fairly clear uh, about how that's covered. But uh, I think moving forward, companies need to be looking at something like this for, you know, how do we keep our employees safe? How do we stay in business? How do we keep operating and avoid some of the things we've run into the last, what is it, 20 months now, I guess, at this point. But no, thanks. I think this is all, all great. I hope I have, Richard, I probably do everyone's contact. Uh, who presented today because I'd like to reach back out and see how we can further uh, some of this discussion. I know some of our members who weren't able to participate today would be very interested in hearing about this and at least start like strategizing how do we make use of some of these uh, some of these products and uh, techniques uh, not so only from the insurance standpoint but where we can let, collaborate with other groups to uh, help uh, promote and get the word out about these uh, very useful very meaningful product. I'm still intrigued by the car and house uh, uh, anti-flood issues and the beads as well. That's uh, looking at the cost savings. If you can just put that number in front of people, what what it means to not have the ship channel pollute, and you can, instead of spending billions, you might spend a few million up front. But uh, from a cost benefit standpoint, it makes sense. So thank you, thank you so much for putting this together, Richard, and getting these great folks to. Uh, connected with us and I'd, I'd like to pursue it further. I know there's a comment uh, about getting a John's uh, product in front of um, RIMS, uh, which I think is probably a good idea. So we can follow up with that as well. I would have uh, one quick thing. One of the things that we're also doing is we recently reached out to home, home builders uh, and we're having meetings with them because whenever you get to the point where they say, congratulations on your new home, now you can pick your flooring, you can pick your alarm system, guess right. what? We have a, a, a air purification uh, uh, system that can go into your HVAC because we do HVACs as well. Uh, okay. In the year of your mortgage, that's pennies on the dollar. Okay. So, All right. That'd be great. Yeah. And, and can I ask a question of Hani? Um, you mentioned the paint containing the protective. Is it possible to put it in roofing materials? Yes. In fact, we've uh, we have been exploring that idea. Uh, obviously, you know that's. That's a little longer term because you have to figure out what what will what will do to the actual roofing material and guarantee. Right. That. But yes, right. you can. that's not a big 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 deal. Okay, okay. So I know yeah. most of the fire when the fire happens, it, it's embers and other things landing on the roof that really engulfs ends up engulfing everything. Right. So okay, yeah. okay. I think I think Honey, when I talked with Mike uh, Francis about this, is that at the minimum on large commercial roofs. You know, this can be done as, again, a, a coating. Um, and honey, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the next stage is to try to figure out that if um, if you can either coat it or embed it in some type of shingle, um, what it may or may not do to the property of the, of the shingle. Um, but I know that that's, you know, pieces of where, um, Albert, the opportunity to do some types of pilots and demonstrations, I think is going to be critical, you know, for these steps. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. For residential, we're working on a clear resin, so that way it doesn't change the look of the shingles. Uh, right. you, you can coat it. Um, easier said than done, but, you know, we're, I think we're pretty close. Uh, for commercial constructions, I don't think anybody cares if the roof is white. Uh, this we can we can color or we can pigment the, the coating, but, but for residential, that's a little bit, you know, more of a HOA and all that, uh, yeah, all that stuff. But yes, we can, we can, we're, we're embedding it into all sorts of uh, materials like cement and plastic. So uh, doing it in shingles, uh, I think at this stage will require us to work with a shingle manufacturer just to, you know, get, get their know-how on, on what are their mechanical properties, how long it should last. Uh, and then we can work on the uh, thermal installation side of it. Perfect. Right. Right. So, Albert, um, I know we're over time, and, and I know a number of your colleagues needed to go. That some of them sent messages. We have recorded this. I'll clean it up a little bit. Um, yeah. And hopefully, by the end of the day, I'll get it, the link back out. If not, it'll be first thing for you to, for all of us to share on um, on Monday, and then you and I can reconnect about starting some of the individual 
uh, linkages here and, and follow up. But thank you, thank you. I again, thank I you. know a lot of folks um, um, actually sent uh, notes to me. Some of your members sent notes saying that today was not going to work for them, but they wanted right. to see the video and then do some follow up. So we'll have an opportunity to reconnect and start aligning folks. But thank you, Albert, for the thank opportunity you, to engage. And thank you all for taking time out on a Friday. And uh, yeah, there's some other groups too that I need to get off, but IBHS uh, yeah. as well, uh, that I think would be good to start, start trying to connect with, with uh, Roy and his group and uh, IHS uh, for yep. the auto issue. So, okay. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, got a lot of good we can do here. And I appreciate y'all sharing your uh, innovations with us. Thanks. Thank right. you. Thank you. Everybody have a great weekend. Thank you, Thank gentlemen. You. Have a good weekend. Okay. Bye-bye. You guys take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.